Welcome to Oyate Today. Oyate means the people in Lakota, brought to you by Skull Construction. Hi, welcome to Oyate Today. I am your host, Richie Richards. Oyate Today is produced by Tim and Jackie Gallego. Tim is an enrolled member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe. Our guest tonight is Dr. Edward Valandra, Chief Educational Officer at St. Francis Indian School on the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation. Yep, yep. Thank you for being here, Dr. Valandra. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, Richie, it's really nice to meet you, and I hope we'll have a really good conversation. I'm excited for it. I'm really glad to have you here. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful for you to travel up here for this as well, so thank you. Um, and for those of us who haven't met you yet or are not aware of your work, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background? Okay, uh, I was born and raised in uh, what we would call in our language Sichanku Makoche, or the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, and uh, in, a, in a community of St. Francis, which traditionally is the Albonic community. <laughs> um, went to a public school, you know, Rosebud Elementary and then Todd County High School and graduated from there. Um, from that point, <coughs> I went to Mankato State University. Sure. And got a BA in chemistry and uh, went back home and served on a, our legislative body, which they call the Tribal Council, for four years. And after that, I decided to go back to graduate school. And from that point on, you know, we could probably talk about the rest of it as we move along, but sure. that's kind of the basic bio. Sure, sure. And so where did you get your master's? And I understand you have a PhD as well then. Yeah. So could you just talk a little bit about that? Oh my, I had a, I got my master's out of the University of Colorado at Boulder. And then uh, I got my PhD out of SUNY Buffalo in New York. Sure. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, those, of course, those are really life-altering experiences, you know, in terms of who my mentors were and just uh, <clears throat> being exposed to, you know, different literature, different people, different thinking and things like that. Sure. I understand your first teaching experience was in ethnic studies. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, um, my first teaching experience uh, is in ethnic, stu is in ethnic studies. Um, at Metropolitan State University. Uh, I got that appointment in 2000. And uh, again, you know, that, was my, that was my platform for eventually moving into uh, Native Studies because Ethnic Studies you know, involves a lot of the ethnic groups and Native Studies is one of them, but eventually I moved in fully into uh, Native Studies. Sure, and so you went on to teach at UC Davis in California then, and you taught Native American Studies there. Yeah, um, after I after spending about four years at the Metropolitan State University in St. Paul, I did apply for a position at uh, UC Davis and uh, got that appointment, and and that was my first launch into uh, Native Studies. They call there they call it Native American Studies, but yeah, as my f uh, first time, I really taught Native Studies um, in California, and it was it was. They took a different approach. They call it a hemispheric approach, which is, you know, uh, North America, South America, Central America. And my focus is mostly, of course, North America. Sure. That whole, e is it the Eagle Condor prophecy? Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yep. North and South. Yep. They bought that together. Yep. And I understand that your uh, dissertation was published not without our consent. Could you tell me what that's about? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had this idea of, of writing about um, the politics of South Dakota, you know, uh, Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota politics in South Dakota. So uh, when I was in, uh, a graduate student in SUNY Buffalo, uh, that was my, my topic was to, to write about um, really the jurisdictional issues that confront us as native nations and then, at, you know, versus states. And uh, <clears throat> so it's really interesting that I wanted to do the 1964 referendum, which um, unfortunately we don't know a lot about. And as I was doing that research, I actually came across an earlier referendum that we did in 1958. So that's what I really focused on, hoping to pick up the 64 stuff later. Mm -hmm. And not without our consent is basically that. Um, the federal government and state government worked hand in hand to um, 
strip us of our jurisdiction and our sovereignty. And, and, and that was without our consent. I mean, they went through the formalities of having hearings, more like consultation, but the writing was on the wall. And so um, I really have to say that um, what we did in the 50s, in 1958 when we had that first referendum, and then again in 1964 when we had that second referendum, I am just so blown away by the political leadership of that time and of that era that I would, I would make it comparable to the leadership of when we gathered um, f for uh, like at the, at the 1857 at, in a, at Bear Butte, mm -hmm. where our leaders just got together and, and really um, talked and planned and strategized brilliantly and we need more of that kind of uh, writing and history because it is, it, when you walk away from that, um, <clears throat> like when I was walking away from the, um, having written all of that, I, I, I had a really profound respect for our leaders of, of the 20th century. I mean, they were just as brilliant and as strategic as our leaders were pre-1900. Yeah. So, so anyway, not without our consent is basically that. we. We want to say in our destiny. Mm -hmm. And so what were those referendums kind of specifically? I mean, what were they geared towards? I mean, what was the focus of those, basically? Oh, the 1958 referendum came, came on the heels of the, of the uh, public law um, 280. Mm -hmm. And Congress had passed that and basically gave states um, permission to go ahead and assume jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And so South Dakota tried to do that in the 50s. And of course, our leadership uh, <clears throat> was able to convince the state legislature that the individual reservations should hold these referendums. And they did, and they rejected it. And that was settled, and then, and then <clears throat> so we thought that we had settled that issue. However, uh, as, um, as we became a more self-determined people, our nation, that issue came up again in 1963 in South Dakota. The state legislature just went ahead and passed a bill just assuming jurisdiction over our homelands. And um, so what happened then was, was, you know, our leaders went to the state house and gave testimony, and, but it, it, it really didn't help because the writing was on the wall. And the state of South Dakota had in its mind to just assume jurisdiction. The amazing thing about that is the leadership, the Lakota, Dakota, and Lakota leadership said, you know what, there's that one proviso in the state's constitution where if a state passes a law, we can refer it. Mm -hmm. So there was a huge campaign going on where you needed, I think at that time, 12,000 signatures to refer to the state. I think we got over 20,000. Wow. And we had to make sure because we figured, you know, the Secretary of State would just go through that with a fine tooth comb. So that referred it to the 64 election. And that, and what's different about the 58 and 64 election was the 58 was just within the reservations. The 64 was statewide. So Native and non-Native got to vote on that. And they did, and the leadership at that time, which my father was a part of that, um, they actually were able to convince, you know, the non-natives of South Dakota that accepting jurisdiction was a bad idea. And that was, for every one vote, yes, for jurisdiction, for voted no. Really? Yeah. So it won by a landslide. Oh, yeah. really by a big landslide, and that has been a definitive uh, referendum, no other, no other nation, native nation in the states have done that. We're the only ones that have done that. And it's a very strong political statement. And that's why there's, I mean, we essentially shut the door on state jurisdiction. It really says a lot, though, about once that leadership comes together, the powers that can be in, in, in South Dakota, which oftentimes were marginalized, were pushed aside. And, uh, you know, but when they band together like that for a movement of such, it really, you know, does a lot for our community. So, it is, it is, it is the potential that exists within us as a people. <clears throat> I, I mean, uh, no doubt we have some differences within our own uh, communities, but when there's that 
when there's that threat that affects all the community, I do see that leadership coming together sure. and just set aside whatever those differences are and then you know, be of one mind and one heart. And I've seen that. That's a, that's, we still have that, actually. Definitely. Uh, Dr. Rolander, we're going to take a break. When we get back, we're going to learn a little bit more about your work there at St. Francis Indian School. So we'll be back after a word from our sponsors. Native American children make up 20% of our school system in Rapid City. The Rural America initiatives, we have a capital campaign going on to build a first-class structure for these children. They've survived for 25 years in modular structures. It's time to bring them together to see this become a dream for these children come true. Please consider donating to Rural American Initiatives and all they have to offer from Head Start to High School in empowering American Indian youth in succeeding in their goals. You can't predict life's ups and downs. You just give it all you've got to stay on top. But it's easier with a partner like Security First Bank. Since 1898, we've been riding with you through the country's biggest ups and downs. And this is where we'll stay. Security First Bank, a relationship you can count on. Member FDIC. Our school has great students and dedicated teachers, but we need our community volunteers to help us to provide a broader view of the many ways a good education can point to a bright future. Did someone say volunteer? Our team at Black Hills is here to help. In fact, we sponsor events and projects, and our employees volunteer for organizations throughout the Black Hills, including partnering with schools to help students learn more about life outside the classroom. Extracurricular, extra fun. We are not so different, you and I. We may be from different places, but the sun that greets me in the morning, the sun that warms the hills, is the same sun that greets you. We are all connected. We are all family. Mitakuye Oyasi. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight is Dr. Edward Valandra, Chief Educational Officer at St. Francis Indian School on the Rosewood Sioux Indian Reservation. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. It's been a good conversation thus far, so I've I appreciate it. it. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, now, I know recently, you, well, for the last couple of years, you've gone from professor to a K through 12 educator at St. Francis Indian School. Can you talk to me about that transition and why that transition was, was made? Okay, well, um, how, I, how I transitioned or segued into uh, K-12 education at St. Francis Indian School was through Teach for America. Mm. You know, that's a pretty arduous process. You have to apply and go through a lot just to be accepted. And, you know, the acceptance rates are very um, stringent. I, I know there's thousands that apply and only maybe 15, 14 percent may be accepted. Mm. Um, so anyway, I use that as my segue back. You know, you figure education is one of those fields in which no one's against education. So, um, so while I was at the University of Manitoba, I had applied to uh, Teach for America to segue back. And so I ended up uh, coming back to St. Francis through Teach for America. And I was to teach, but when I showed up to sign my contract, they put me in an administrative position because of my experience. Mm -hmm. So um, that's been an interesting transition, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, I, I find that uh, you know, K-12 education has a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of structure, and um, which of course is very different from, from university. But I think ultimately what we, whether you're a university professor or not, or a uh, K-12 uh, faculty member, it, it, the education of our children is just so germane to who we are as a people and what we want from that education. Mm -hmm. And so I guess specific to St. Francis and uh, you know what are some of the challenges that you deal with say with you know students coming in and, in and out of the classrooms down there, what are some of the things that you face as chief educational officer down there at St. Francis? Well you know and uh, and I think one of the things that I find uh, really challenging for us is always the fiscal part of it, you know. 
um, and then allocating the resources so we get um, you know, maximal benefit out of that. So one of the things that uh, me and my uh, partner, my co-CEO, uh, Luan Wardell, um, we have you know, stepped back and um, have looked at you know, how the money is allocated, once allocated for. We looked at the scores of our children. Um, we looked at the professional development of our faculty and support staff. And so for me, I want to professionalize our staff. So we have a lot of professional development money. So we've developed a, what we call a professional development Monday, you know, once a month. And we've invited speakers such as um, Robert Cook. He'll be one of the keynotes for September. Uh, we have um, Stephanie Autumn uh, for October. Uh, she's big into restorative justice. So we have lined up eight or nine really powerful speakers so that so then that they are the uh, and native so that we can expose our faculty and, and the community to um, what's going on in native country throughout the US and part of that professional development is um, we realize that we mandated that our faculty have to take at least one Lakota, Dakota, or Nakota studies course per academic year. Wow. We put that in the contracts. And we also put in the contracts that um, there at least has, they have to attend at least two um, culturally responsive teaching workshops as part of the contracts. Then our paraprofessionals, we're trying to upgrade them into like being highly qualified para paraprofessionals to move on to maybe even becoming teachers. So for me, I thought professionalism was key to um, you know, St. Francis uh, uh, core. Like, what do, we, what do we want? And we really have been pushing to professionalize our, our faculty and our support staff. Our, you know, and we feel one of the things that we understand, you know, it's not about the children so much. Um, they're really important, but to change an educational system, you have to change the adults. So that's what we're really trying to focus on. If we change the adults, in so many, you know, positive ways, that'll that'll be reflected in the classroom where the greatest impact is on our sure. children. So, you know, rather than doubling down and requiring more hours for reading, more re hours for math, let's professionalize our, our faculty and our support staff, and that'll have the impact in that classroom. And so, how has your staff, or how has the staff responded to this? Are they excited about this change then? Or yeah, I, I think they are. You know, um, especially as we, especially as we've included them in the decision making process. We have this correlate system. We have plenary sessions, and you know, we have almost eighty to one hundred of our faculty and staff, and we have these plenary sessions to talk about a lot of these different issues. So. It, it, they have a, they have buy-in on that, yeah. Good, that's good. So they're actually part of that discussion and oh, that planning so. process. Yeah. That's good. That's good leadership, by the way. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> well, one of the transitions I had with, with coming into K-12 was, um, you know, it's so hierarchical. You know, you have your educational leader and it's down. Whereas we, me and my colleague, uh, Luan Worrell, decided that we should start from the bottom up and democratize that process, decision-making process. And the staff has responded well to that. Sounds like he created a, a circle as opposed to a ladder, so that's awesome. I hope so, yes. That's awesome. <laughs> um, native education in general, what do you see some of the challenges just for native education in all of our schools or across the board or across the states? I mean, where are we at with this uh, as far as where we're going? Well, you know, to be a little bit bold, and um, audacious, I would say the Western educational model has failed us. Mm -hmm. And then we have to really reflect on that. What does that mean? Um, I think there's a lot of colonization that goes on in the Western educational model. Mm -hmm. So we may learn more about, um, let's say, the colonizer's history than we have about our own history. Mm -hmm. And so we really have to examine that because um, one of the fundamental, um, I, I think, elements of being successful is you know who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And that knowing who you are is really a bulwark against you know, any kind of challenge that's that come. So native education, I think, 
has a lot to do with seeing ourselves reflected in the curriculum, seeing ourselves reflected in the staff, seeing ourselves reflected in the educational leadership of the school. And, um, and, and I, I know we mentioned earlier about, I think one of, the, one of the hallmarks of Native education historically has been that it, it produced very critical thinkers. Yes, and let's get into that very thought after this next uh, commercial break here. So we're gonna take a break. When we get back, we're gonna talk about critical thinking and the impact that has on our communities. We'll be back after a word from our sponsors. Our future is our children. Their hope is you. Hi, Jeff Bridges here. Help our children grow strong for the next seven generations. 20% of Rapid City school children are Native American. Many come from difficult situations, experiencing hopelessness and despair. Rural America Initiatives brings hope and opportunity, one dream at a time, one child at a time, one family at a time. Please, make a tax-deductible contribution. Be a part of the dream. Native Sun News has been voted the best weekly newspaper in its class for 2015 by the South Dakota and North Dakota Newspaper Associations. You can find a copy of the Native Sun News at many businesses and vending machines in Rapid City and the surrounding area and on all nine reservations. We publish every Wednesday so advertisers and subscribers can reach our diverse readership by calling 605-721-1266. The Native Sun News covers the other side of the story. Hi, welcome back to Oyate Today. Once again, our guest tonight is Dr. Edward Valandra, Chief Educational Officer at St. Francis Indian School. It's been a pleasure, sir. It's been my pleasure as well. Cool, Thank you. cool. This has been a good discussion. Um, let me hear a little bit about some of the mentors in your life. Who inspired you to become an educator, to, to do the work you're doing? Uh, um, of course, you know, we could talk all night about that, but... Sure. Of course, my, my parents, my mother and father, they were community leaders in that regard. So, you know, growing up, under, growing up and listening to the conversations underneath the kitchen table, I think were part of my um, learning process, um, educational process. So that's, you know, the education in the home, listening, because my father was um, the president of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. And so hearing those discussions underneath the table. And then my mother, of course, was a businesswoman, which was unusual for a woman, let alone a native woman, to be doing that in the 40s and 50s. So I think they were for sure my mentors. The next mentor, I think, is really, I would say, led me to where I'm at right now, uh, a man by the name of Frank LaPointe. He was on the tribal council, and uh, I uh, tied myself to him. He was a conscience of the council. He was always very conscientious and meticulous about the bigger picture of, of the role of what it was to be a, uh, a states person. And so I, I, really, I really credit him a lot to um, him mentoring me as a young legislator for my nation and then you know just really thinking clearly. The other part of that, I think, we talked a little bit more um, at the academic level. First on my list is Vine Deloria Jr. Of course. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, I owe him so much because he, he pushed and pushed and pushed. And I always felt that he was harder on Native students than he was on non-Native students because he wanted to get the most out of us. And one of the things I really will credit him for 
is not to do, to do research and scholarship in the safe harbors. Go out and challenge and question, you know, and push the envelope in your scholarship because Native Studies is basically for the defense of Native peoples, the sovereignty and the self-determination. So you, you, cannot, you cannot hold back on that. And so he was a really great mentor for that. And then when I was at uh, SUNY Buffalo, John Mohawk, um, the, the, one of the giants of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we had Orrin Lyons there, um, the late Barry White, who was Seneca, and then Rick Hill was there, Jolene Rickert. Uh, um, those were excellent mentors because um, those were mentors who I think um, really showed that there can be a marriage between community and the academy. And, um, and as I got more and more into my um, academic career as a scholar, then Elizabeth Cook Lynn enters the picture. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth Cook Lynn, Vine, um, John Mohawk, all those had shown me that there can be a seamless web between the academy and the community. And they were that first generation of Native study scholars who really, I think, uh, bought that perspective in, into the discipline of Native studies in mainstream. I'd have to admit, their doing that was a little bit rough for them because, you know, they were they were more they were like community intellectuals. So they really set out a framework and a role model for how then how that influenced me. Um, I think you know they talk about town and gown. There has to be that connection. I say there has to be a connection between page and sage. You know, if you're reading, but also Prayer. understanding that. And uh, one of the things I know when I would return home from college and maybe go to the senior citizen center and talk to the grandmas and the grandpas, and they often reminded me, "Don't forget where you came from and who you are." And that was tr that was really great. Sure. And so that critical thought, that, or excuse me, that critical thinking is very important to our communities and our students of today, so. There is, when I think about the, like when we talked about the 64 referendum, it's clear that that leadership was brilliant. I mean, they knew what they had to do, and so they just, they just outlined a plan of action. Sure. Step to it. Uh, Dr. Valandra, I want to thank you for the conversation tonight. I want to thank our, our viewers. I want to thank our producers and sponsors. And I want to thank you for making Oyate Today a part of your night. You've been watching Oyate Today, brought to you by Skull Construction.